And uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our series, Stay at Home and Stay Connected series. Today we are in conversation with Dr. Rajmohan Gandhi. Uh, Rajmohan, if I may call you that, welcome, namaskar and salam. Hope you're thank doing you. good. Thank and, you, thank you. And staying healthy and safe during this uh, social distancing COVID related. Uh, but it's a privilege and an honor, uh, uh, Rajmohan, that uh, you have consented to do this interview. And we are very grateful for that. And uh, uh, just, uh, uh, I, I know with your uh, personality, your lineage, you know, uh, nobody really needs any introduction, but, uh, uh, but for sake of someone in the audience who may not know enough about you, I will enumerate some of the salient highlights of your career in public service, if I may, uh, knowing uh, very well that it'll not do justice to your amazing achievements. Uh, I, I took this off your website. Uh, you are a, a writer, a prolific in that sense. Uh, you are a public speaker, historian, journalist, and a biographer, and above all, an ambassador for trust building and reconciliation. And that's what the goal we have in mind today when we do this conversation. And right now you are a, a research professor at College of Education at the University of Illinois. And you've been a member of the Rajya Sabha uh, in India for uh, a couple of years uh, in 90s or so. And then you also have a blog that I may uh, for the uh, benefit of the audience to share with them. It's www.himmat.net, uh, a space as Rajmohan called, what must be said. And I like that, what you're saying that, you know, a lot of people shy away from the words and uh, some of the truths which are uh, very relevant and very biting sometimes, but we got to face the truths. Uh, uh, your father, as you know, as everybody knows, uh, Dev Das Gandhi was editor of Hindustan Times. And I think you were related to Hindustan Times for some time also, I believe. And your paternal grandfather was Mahatma Gandhi the Great, and uh, who was an icon of nonviolence. And your maternal grandfather, Raja Gopalachari, was the second governor general of India after Lord Mountbatten. Uh, you have written numerous books on India, Pakistan, and uh, relations between India and Pakistan, and a strong proponent of reconciliation between the two countries. And with that, uh, uh, I'll ask you if I have missed anything that you want to uh, say before we start the conversation, which will basically be from your book, Punjab, A History from Aurangzeb and Mountbatten. Thank you. And before I do that, may I extend uh, greetings, including Eid greetings. We're not so many days after Eid. So I would like to extend those greetings and greetings to everybody who may be listening or watching. Um, so this book, uh, Punjab, a history from Aurangzeb to Mountbatten was written some years ago by me, uh, published in 2013. So when I looked at it again for this particular conversation, Yes, I felt to begin with that I was reading somebody else's book because it was written some time, some time back. But uh, let me uh, uh, remind persons, uh, I think many who might be watching this perhaps are connected to Punjab. Some of them might be uh, and uh, the Pakistani Punjab, the Indian Punjab. Uh, of course, many people today in India and Pakistan don't know that once upon a time there was a huge Punjab which consisted of Pakistani Punjab, Indian Punjab, Indian Haryana, Indian Himachal. It was an undivided uh, province and it was divided, of course, in 1947. So um, when Aurangzeb died in 1707, that was the beginning of some kind of a vacuum in Punjab. The Mughal Empire retreated from Punjab after Aurangzeb's death. And there was a vacuum uh, which was filled uh, eventually by the Sikhs. And then the British defeated the Sikhs and the British took over. So, uh, and, and of course in 1947 was the 
partition, the trauma, the freedom, the independence Pakistan was created. Uh, so uh, the Delhi, uh, where I was born in 1935, was not the more or less Punjabi city it would become after 1947. In those early days, Delhi's was a non-Punjabi world, uh, despite the fact that from 1858 until 1911, the British had administered Delhi as part of their Punjab province. But with 1947, Delhi changed demographically, linguistically. Muslim boys in my school, I was 12 at the time, we didn't have a great number of Muslim boys, but Muslim boys vanished from one day to the next with 47. One of them, a classmate of mine, was called Javed Akhtar. His father, Chaudhary Muhammad Ali, then one of Delhi's top civil servants, would serve as Pakistan's prime minister in the 1950s. Even as Muslim boys disappeared from my school, a number of Punjabi boys, Sikh and Hindu, materialized. Several Punjabi teachers uh, from Lahore also came and joined my, my school. Now, as Punjab was traumatized in 1947, Delhi started becoming Punjabiized. Even if they belonged to non-Punjabi tracts, at least two generations of Indians and Pakistanis were affected by Punjab's suffering. That long-lasting trauma, or rather the need among Indians and Pakistanis to get out of that trauma is probably the strongest impulse, even if mostly in the subconscious behind this inquiry that leads to this book. So I was venturing uh, into this effort under a half recognized pull to assist, never mind how poorly, in healing the wound of 1947. So this is how the book got going. Now, I, I was. Uh, I must mention that uh, after Aurangzeb dies, there's a kind of vacuum, uh, scramble for power in Punjab. And uh, in due course, uh, some of the Afghans uh, from Kabul uh, become very influential. But in effect, uh, it is the Sikhs who take over as the Mughal uh, control over Punjab uh, disappears. Um, and there was one very interesting Muslim Punjabi who for a very brief while, only for five months actually, ran Punjab. Mm. And his was the only example uh, of a Punjabi Muslim becoming in charge of Punjab during this time. So this is in the 1750s, about 40 years or so after Aurangzeb's death and before the Sikhs have taken control. And this man was called uh, Adina Ali Beg, Adina Beg Khan, Adina Beg Khan. So um, he was willing to exercise control in Punjab. He was a local chief. He was a peasant from a peasant family, but he was very astute, very ambitious, very hardworking. And uh, he managed for some time to take control of Punjab and he is a forgotten figure, and I was very glad that in my study I was able to bring Adina Beg Khan uh, to life. Now, uh, he died, uh, and uh, that again le left, left a vacuum. And, and, and as I said earlier, the Sikhs uh, filled the vacuum. And one of the questions I asked and tried to answer in my research and in my book was, why is it that these Sikhs of Punjab, who were a minority, uh, why is it that they were able to take over Punjab and run Punjab for some time before the British came? Why did the Muslim Punjabis not manage to control Punjab as the Mughal power retreated? Now, the Muslim Punjabis were a majority. Yes, they were a very large majority in Western Punjab, what became Pakistani Punjab. They were uh, not a my majority in the eastern part, but if you took Punjab as a whole, uh, undivided Punjab, the Muslims are by far the largest single group. The Hindus were the next group, if you are thinking of religious uh, groups, uh, and the Sikhs were the third group. Mm. But it was the smallest of the three groups that managed to take over Punjab for some time. So part of my inquiry uh, 
and I will read a few lines on, on this. Why is it that uh, uh, the Sikhs managed to take over? So um, for one thing, uh, the Sikh groups, the Sikh clans, they were called the missiles, Sikh missiles a clan or a, or a community group. There were different Sikh missiles in different parts of Punjab, each headed by some kind of uh, chief who was uh, quite soldierly and he had some fighters, band of fighters with him. Uh, sometimes, in fact, uh, in one or two cases, the Sikh bands were led by a woman also. But anyway, so uh, the fact that the Afghan invasions after Aurangzeb's death, there was Nadir Shah who came and then there was uh, Ahmad Shah Abdali, also known as Ahmad Shah Durrani. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of suffering when the Afghan attacks took place in Punjab. And uh, the Sikhs were willing to fight the Afghans. And many of the Punjab peasants, including many of the Muslim peasants and the Sikhs and the Hindus were willing to appreciate the fact that the Sikhs had put up uh, quite a fight uh, uh, for the Punjabi farmers. Now also, uh, the Sikhs seem to have a faith in some kind of destiny that they had, that they had this deep conviction that they might one day control Punjab. Uh, they had fighting skills. Uh, they also had traits of dash, of opportunism. And in some ways, the Sikhs foreshadowed uh, the British imperialists of the 18th and 19th centuries. Now, uh, the Sikhs' drive for power was sharpened by religion. Uh, now, Muslim groups in Punjab too were capable of invoking religious zeal, but there was a significant difference. When his religion reached the Sikh peasant in his own language, inviting an unreserved embrace, this was not necessarily the case with the Muslim peasant, who was also Punjabi speaking, but who usually received his Islam in Arabic. So the Sikh received his religion in Punjabi. The Muslim Punjabi received his religion in Arabic. This also made some difference. Um, also, uh, Sikh rural society was far more egalitarian at that time than the Muslim uh, rural society. Sikh leaders, most of them Jats, profited from the spirit of equality accepted in many of the missiles. Such a spirit was generally absent in the more steeply hierarchical military force of a Muslim chief or a landlord in Punjab, who was often a Rajput when he was not a Sayyid, or he was a Sheikh or a Mughal, and only in some cases the Jat, even though Jats were perhaps the largest single community among Punjab's Muslims at the time. It was Jat culture and not Sikhism alone that helped produce the Sikh missiles camaraderie which proved valuable in battle. And I think uh, if you, you study the picture overall, you conclude in hindsight that spurred by psychological and religious impulses, the Sikhs successfully captured a current of pro-peasant Punjabi nationalism, which they had also helped create. If perceiving such a current, a few Muslim chiefs had together provided an alternative rallying stage for Punjabi nationalism. Could they have attracted Sikh and Hindu allies and gone on to fill the vacuum uh, that the Sikh, Sikh missiles eventually filled? This question is a purely rhetorical one. There is no evidence that after Adina Beg Khan, any Muslim Punjabi chief envisioned a rallying platform or grasped the potential in an all Punjab pro-peasant strategy. So uh, now I, I will proceed to one of the two most famous uh, Punjabi poets that everybody is aware of. Ulla Shah is one who preceded uh, Waris Shah, that is Waris Shah. So I'll say a word or two about Waris Shah. So no text gives a better picture of life in Punjab of this period I'm talking about the late uh, 18th century, the 1760s, 1770s. Uh, then, and no, no text gives a better picture of life in this period than Waris Shah's Heer, composed in 1766. Now, Waris 
paints Northwestern Punjab as the backdrop for the old love story of Heer and Ranja. He gives us the Chanab, its boats and its boatmen, peasants who farm, the men who herd cattle, green grazing grounds and women spinning cotton into yarn. He pictures the feudal system, including a clan chief, a, data, a, sorry, a daughter ready to outwit or defy the father. He gives us mullahs, jogis, Sufis, and more. Why did Varis's Heer supersede earlier visions? Other people too had written poetry about Heer and Ranja. Varis's version was in a blunt and earthy Punjabi of the kind that the peasants spoke. Because his meter in his poetry offered the rhythm that the Punjabi peasants loved. And because the love he narrated, the longing for each other in Heer and Ranja, which Varis liked to the longing for God in each soul, this longing was what, in reality or imagination, the Punjabi peasant also possessed. The Punjabi peasant or a goat herd might not have known comfort or dignity, but he or she was capable of love or of imagining love. We can believe that the common people of Punjab identified with Heer and Ranja, whose background was similar to theirs through the dice of war or fate, ordinary Punjabis were losing lives or loved ones. Abdali's uh, invasion, Nadir Shah's invasion, lots of fighting. So people were losing lives. There was a lot of fighting. Through here, where love was stolen by fate, they felt closer also to those from whom love was stolen by war. If therefore, we wish to imagine Punjab as it was during the last four decades of the 18th century, from 1760 to say 1800. We can, among other things, picture to ourselves a large rural audience listening to Waris Shah, a laughing and crying audience of Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus, even perhaps including to one side a knot of women, galloping horses and falling bodies should not be allowed to fill our entire mental screen. If there was war in Punjab in the 18th century, there also was peace. Um, so this is about Kheer uh, Ranjha by Baris Shah. So I want now to move on to much more recent times, com comparatively speaking. Uh, my story is a long one, 1707 to 1947, so much happened in that time. And then we're all familiar with what, what happened in 1947. And I, I give the story of how partition came, how independence came, how the carnage developed. Um, it's, it's a sad story, it's a painful story. But there are some amazing uh, uh, instances also in that story. So here I'm reading from a chapter in my book called Insaniyat Amidst Insanity. Insaniyat Amidst Insanity. Carnage was not the whole story of Punjab 1947. In their villages and towns, many ordinary Punjabis protected vulnerable ones and helped them escape. In recent years, attempts have been made to obtain and record these life-saving acts. One such effort was made in Lahore during nine days in July, nine, July 2005 by this author, that's me, and my wife, Usha Gandhi. So I will read just a few excerpts from what uh, we wrote as a result of the interviews we had in Lahore in 2005. Responding to a message from a woman who insisted that she had to meet us in Lahore, we went to her home in Lahore's township colony, where we were warmly welcomed by Naila Parvez, her husband Dawood, and other members of the family. It was her husband's story that Naila wanted us to hear. Dawood was two and a half years old, his head and elbow slashed, Naila said, when in 1947, he was brought to one of Lahore's refugee camps 
the Walton camp, I think it was. This is what Naila Parve said to us, quote, he knows nothing about his family. We don't know if anybody came with him. We don't know of any relatives of his. Then she says to us, my wife and me, can you help find out? Dawood showed us the large furrow on his scalp and the scars on the elbow left by the childhood wounds inflicted, they had heard, by Kirpans. The child Dawood had been adopted by Naila's aunt. In due course, Naila and Dawood got married. Naila longed for her husband to find his roots. And though there was nothing we could do to help, she seemed glad to express her wish to people from across the border where somewhere the origins of Dawood lay. Now the gash on Dawood Parvese's head and his wife's unanswerable plea underlined the tragic fact that the bulk of 1947 stories will remain unknown and unrecorded. Uh, and this is something that we should emphasize and recognize. We all know that a very large number of people were killed. Muslims were killed, Hindus were killed, Sikhs were killed by an incredible design, I suppose, or whatever. The fact was that an equal number of Muslims and non-Muslims were killed in the terrible carnage of 47. But we only know of a few people who were killed by name. Uh, the vast majority of those who were killed were very poor, humble people with no records of when they were killed, where they were killed, how they were killed. So this is one of the most painful aspects of the 47 carnage, that we don't have even a proper record of the names of those who were killed, but we do know that the vast majority of those who were killed were very humble people. Yes, there were some from the elite too who were killed, quite a few, but the vast majority were the very humble people. Now here is something that was told to us by a man called Abdul Rab Malik, originally from Koita, Balochistan. The family of Abdul Rab Malik who was 84 when we met him. Retired director in the excise department, originally belonged to Batala in Gurdaspur district in what is now Indian Punjab. But I was born in Ziyara, Malik told us, a hill station near Koita. Father had settled in Balochistan. We interviewed Malik on 22nd July 2005 in his house in Lahore's model town, where many well-off Hindus and Sikhs had resided before partition. A Hindu temple stood near the house, but with no sign of the worshippers. Malik was happy to learn that my wife Usha's Sindhi parents had lived in Quetta before leaving for India in 1947. Recalling events in Quetta, he spoke of his Sikh subordinate, Sub-Inspector Sardar Jinder Singh, whom he had called to his home to prepare a raid in a cinema house as part of his job as excise, excise uh, inspector. He said, Rajinder Singh came in at about 8.30 p.m. By this time, riots had begun in the town and we could hear sounds of an uproar outside. The Sardar got frightened. I said, you are safe in my hands. I will take care of you. Then Malik took out a burqa for the Sardar to wear accompanied him to his house, which was nearby along with his own wife, also in a burqa, and two constables in uniform. He, he warned the Sardar not to leave his house. The next morning, Malik went to his subordinate's home, personally took Rajinder Singh, his wife and their son, all dressed in burqas, to the railway station. He told us, we went in a hired car and saw that they sat in the train. From Quetta to Lahore, my people traveled with them. They reached their destination in India. There was a Ram Bagh in Amritsar from where he wrote a letter of thanks. Malik also spoke of a Hindu, Seth Hemaldas, the biggest sweetmeat merchant in town, Mithai seller, who lived three or four houses away from Malik's house. The Seth served Mithai free of cost to all the poets who went to his shop. Poets were mostly Muslim poets. One night at the peak of the riots, the Seth's son, Leela Ram, arrived at Malik's house with a bunch of keys in his hand. These were the keys to their shop. 
I went to the state's shop, said Malik, opened his safe, took out 24,000 rupees and the jewelry in the safe, brought the stuff home, put a burqa on Lira Ram, accompanied him to his house and delivered the valuables to his father. The next day, Malik, along with his sergeants, accompanied the state and his family to much railway station, 50 miles from Kota, and put them on a train. Quote, they reached Karnal in Indian Punjab, safe and sound, unquote. But said Abdul Rab Malik, there were those he could not save. He told us, quote, Sardar Ram Singh owned a furniture shop. Mr. Scott, the British superintendent of police, shot down dozens of rioters. I saw 20 bodies on the road. Going on a bicycle with a friend, I used a cycle in those days, said Malik. I saw Sardar Ram Singh coming in, in, coming in a Morris minor. He was stopped by a crowd pulled out by his hair, burnt and placed on the engine of his car, unquote. Said Abdul, Abdul Rab Malik, my own eyes, these sinful eyes have seen that sight, unquote. Now here's a story about a woman called Sugra Rashid, originally from Jalandhar. On 19 July, 2005, in her sister's home in Thokar Niyazbeg, in Lahore, we met Sugra Rashid. Now, we had known in broad terms from her niece, Aruna Kamal, who's a friend of ours, that Sugra Rashid had lost several relatives in the city of Jalandhar in 1947. In 1947, Sugra was a young wife and mother in Delhi. Her husband, Abdul Rashid, was a railway officer from a family hailing from the villages of Singapura and Uggi near Jalandhar. The husband's brother was a young doctor, also based in Delhi. The husband's father, a retired railway officer, lived in the railway colony in Jalandhar city. We asked Sugra Rashid for the names and ages of those who had been killed in August 47 in Jalandhar. Her answer was given clearly, calmly and solemnly, and filled with brief pauses as she tried to remember. She said, Dr. Badruddin, the father of my husband, he was killed. He was 60. Fatima, his, my husband's mother, she was 55. Jamila, their newly married daughter, my husband's sister. Tahira, their younger daughter, who was 22. Kutubuddin, my husband's nana, who was also my dada, he was 80. Idu, a mulazim, Idu's wife, Fateh, five children of Idu and Fateh. These were the people she said were killed in 47 in Jalanda. We were moved by this brief recreation through naming of the killed, and perhaps especially by the naming of the servants. Like the vast majority of the killed of 1947, the servants had lacked the means or critical contacts in the military or the police or the railways that made escape possible for many of the better off, though not in this case for Sugra's relatives. She recalled, the family was living in a Hindu mohalla on the main road with only two Muslim homes. Amne Samne was a Hindu family who had said to my husband's family, don't go away. I remember two girls from that family, Sheila and Dhanu. I don't think the family could have been involved, Sugra added. I think they were helpless before the attackers. Sugra had a happier story too to tell. Her husband's older brother, Sharif, was in Solan, also in East Punjab, with his young wife and a two-month-old daughter. Their lives, said Sugra, were protected by Hindu friends who then helped them to move across to West Punjab. But Sugra's Nani Aisha, who was part of a walking caravan trying to reach Pakistan, died on the way, as also the Nani's sister, Gina. After recounting these events, Sugra said, Itna jalandar yaad aata hai. Jab koi jalandar ki baat karta hai, dil mein kuch ho jata hai. I remember jalandar so much. Whenever anyone speaks of jalandar, something happens inside my heart. So these are some of the interviews. 
Now, a three-part report of our Lahore interviews was published in the Tribune in India on 16, 23, and 30 October of 2005. Letters received in response to our report, some of these letters were published in the Tribune, offered accounts of other life-saving acts of 1947, which the senders of the letters had heard of in their families. These accounts confirmed first that courageous deeds of protection were widespread in, were widespread in 1947. And secondly, that those who performed or witnessed such acts recounted them to the next generation. If more such stories are accessed and shared, the underreporting of the Insaniyat of 1947 can be corrected. So I hope very much that if listeners of this conversation are aware or remember stories that they have heard of their family members protected others, or how their family members were protected by others, by others from the other community. Recording those stories and preserving them, perhaps in the South Asia Institute or elsewhere, whichever is an appropriate place, would be a very uh, constructive act that anyone possessing those stories can perform. So I'll stop here. Uh, very well said, uh, Raj Mohan, and very moving uh, reading that you did of your book and uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating book. And I found uh, it to be very easy reading, very detailed about people, places, and events. Uh, but uh, you're right. Uh, I think a uh, uh, lot of bad things happened uh, in 1947, partition. But a lot of good things happened. A lot of good people did a lot of good things. And I think if we share our goodness with each other, it's going to make a lot of difference. And, uh, uh, you know, when, when partition took place, uh, I was four years old. And I was born in Delhi, uh, the other side. And uh, my father used to be uh, in the Indian civil service. And he was aware of what the plans were brewing. And he knew what was going to happen. So he sent us out uh, to our ancestral village, which was about five or six miles from, uh, from the border, or would have been the border. Uh, so we left early in 1947. At that time, I was four years old. And ours was one of the last few trains that went through to the other side without any molestations. Uh, but I still remember, and that's the most earliest vivid memories that I have of those early days because we were living in this village called Bahlulpur in Sialkot district, which was about, as I said, six, seven miles away. Grandfather used to be in the military, so he had just retired a little while ago. So he was at home and he had asked for some of the military to be stationed in that area. So none of these uh, uh, bad things can happen in our village. And I remember, you know, there were a lot of people, Sikhs and Hindus used to congregate in our big house in the village over there. And he would every few days walk four or five miles to the border and put them across the border so nobody can molest them. Because he had uh, with him his uh, cousins and his, uh, uh, brothers and uh, sisters uh, who were in the village also, and they would accompany uh, him to the border also. So I think, uh, you know, a lot can be said about that, and you're right. I think if we could uh, do more of this, you know, uh, preview some people that have done good things, because a lot of the people are at an age where they are unhappily passing away. So I think before that happens, we have to record that historical facts as to, you know, what, uh, what good was done by some people. Uh, but I think uh, uh, you make a very good point that I think we need to, uh, we need to uh, propagate this goodness that has happened and the goodness that we are willing to do 
And I know a lot of people had a lot of, uh, a lot of bad things happen to them and a lot of bad things uh, happened to people and a lot of bad things were done by people. And I think all the bad people, you know, uh, egged on all the good people to do all these kind of things. But it's our uh, preview that we should try to, uh, uh, try to do some kind of a reconciliation act like you're doing by talking about it more and maybe uh, propagating this idea of insaniyat, as you uh, say. Uh, but before, uh, uh, before I go any further, I would like to ask a few questions, if I may. Uh, uh, you mentioned that, uh, uh, that Punjabis are distinct people, not homogeneous in your book, uh, and feel bound to each other by language rather than religion. Uh, I may ask if you can elaborate on that statement that you made in your book. Okay, so incidentally, um, in my book, my attempt is to record as far as I could collect the information, uh, what happened. Uh, I was not trying to discover who the guilty men were, who the heroes were, who the villains were, but as far as possible, a recollection, a, a collection of information as to what actually happened in different parts of Punjab. So uh, I was not, uh, my aim was not to present any theories, but to try and explain uh, as far as I could figure out what, what had happened. So uh, yes, uh, I found that uh, uh, the Punjabi language, Punjabi culture did in many ways, not entirely, in many ways it transcended the religious differences. So uh, there was, uh, now, uh, I mentioned Waris Shah and Bullah Shah. So their poetry is recited to this day by Punjabis, Hindu Punjabis, Sikh Punjabis, and of course, Muslim Punjabis. So there was a linguistic link, a cultural link, the, uh, and most of them were peasants. So there was a farming link. So those are very profound links, uh, which were observed uh, between uh, and as you, you had mentioned, the Sufi influence, and there was Baba Farid, and the Baba Farid and Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikhism, had uh, this very uh, remarkable uh, connection. Uh, and so uh, between Guru Nanak and between the Sufis also, there was, there was a profound connection. So uh, the, the soil of Punjab has this rich heritage also of friendship, coexistence, even partnership. But we must recognize that this was not really as deep-rooted, as widespread as we would have liked. So uh, yes, people took part in festivals uh, of the other religion, religious group, but it did not go much beyond that. Uh, so there wasn't really a fusion. There was some coexistence, some friendship even, some cooperation, but the Muslims, the Hindus, the Sikhs never quite became one community, even though the Punjabi language and culture was a very powerful bond. Uh, yeah, I, I know that uh, you've had uh, uh, been speaking about this uh, bridge building and reconciliation yeah. between the different communities. Uh, what kind of uh, reception have you had different groups on both sides of the border? Uh, you know, there is, there is, uh, there are on both sides of the border still people, A, who remember the days when there was one undivided Punjab, when there was a fair amount of uh, interchange, mixture of, uh, of, of life between uh, Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus in Punjab. So, and who uh, preserve their memories. And, but in more recent years, of course, as the political differences between India and Pakistan have increased, even these cultural revivals and celebrations of insaniyat, celebrations of commonality, even celebrations of great poetry are fewer and fewer, but they still exist. And there are novelists and poets, playwrights, both sides of the border who courageously demonstrate, recall what happened in the past and also uh, who envision something very great in the future. Side by side with that, we also have people who uh, 
profit in division, who profit in stories of prejudice, who would like to emphasize, exaggerate, underline uh, the sad things that happened, the bitter things that happened, the horrible things that happened. And so there are those who say that uh, Muslim Punjabis, Sikh Punjabis, Hindu Punjabis can never really work together. And there are others who very stoutly assert the opposite. So it depends on the dedication, commitment, painstaking effort of all of us who believe that friendship is possible, that even forgiveness is possible. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, as far as the very long future is concerned, uh, our deep uh, faith in the Almighty in the in the eventual goodness of human nature uh, will tell some of us or many of us that one day there will be real reconciliation but one day means so many different things it can mean 10 years it can mean a hundred years so perhaps we have to work harder to make the span of time shorter rather than longer very well said and i think that was the reason why uh, we set up this South Asia Institute because we felt that we are basically the same people. We are divided on the basis of religion and political leaning. And I think our food is the same, our dress is the same, the way we think is the same, our background is the same. Uh, so the idea was to you know, gather together in some place where we can eliminate our differences and propagate our commonality. So that's the idea of uh, South Asia Institute. And I think uh, you are a big uh, proponent of that. I can see that and we wish you all the luck in your, uh, uh, in your endeavor of bridge building, reconciliation. Uh, and last question that I would ask is, do you have more hope in the younger generations, looking past our differences and looking more towards our commonality, so we can come to that uh, come to that bridge. I do, without a doubt, I do. Uh, however, there is a a, a little problem. Uh, the young people don't even know that once upon a time there was undivided Punjab, mm. and that many Muslims and Sikhs and Hindus had very good and strong and cordial relations and trade and so forth. So it's essential that uh, the younger generation, especially I'm thinking of those of Pakistani origin, Indian origin, who live in the US uh, or elsewhere outside India, that they learn something about the past. Uh, very few uh, today in Pakistani Punjab will know young people, young men and women, that uh, in a city like Amritsar, 47% were Muslims once upon a time, in 47. Right. That in Jalandhar, in Ludhiana, the cities of Jalandhar and Ludhiana in Indian Punjab, the Muslims were a majority. Uh, very few know in India, similarly, that so many Hindus and Sikhs lived in Lahore, so many Hindus and Sikhs lived in Rawalpindi, Multan. So the memory of a common life uh, is uh, no longer present in, in many young minds. But I think this is where uh, your center will play a very powerful part. And whoever has the ability whether to write, to communicate, to leave behind a record, to leave behind stories, uh, can, can play a very great part. And But I totally and completely share the view that young Pakistanis, young Indians uh, will uh, overcome this very uh, costly and, and completely foolish division. No, I agree with you. Can you imagine if the amount of money we spend in our arms, both countries, if that was spent for the welfare of the common man, where would India and Pakistan would have been by now? Absolutely right. Absolutely. But you know, it's not, it's not too late. And, and even going beyond just India and Pakistan or going beyond Punjab, or Punjabis of uh, 
Muslim, Sikh, or Hindu background, uh, you know, many people who live in the United States uh, are aware of so many other uh, divisions. You know, there are so many profound divisions. Even the COVID crisis has revealed all over the world how the inequalities, the divisions, uh, the discriminations in societies have uh, accentuated the COVID-19 crisis. Right. So as and when Pakistanis and Indians come together and uh, get beyond the bitter memories of the past and, and show their reconciliation, show their partnership, they have a very large part to play also in helping the rest of society in the United States or wherever they may be living in the world. So I, 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 I think in, in what you say, there is a suggestion that Indians and Pakistanis uh, could have a role uh, for also for the wider, wider world in which we, we live. And especially in the United States, uh, since there is a lot of people of color, uh, especially Hispanics and Blacks, and I think if we- Absolutely right. If we, if we get all those communities together, we can be very strong and we can create a positive change in this country also. So, I, and I think your South Asia Institute can also help with that, and I'm sure is helping with that. So, uh, it is a, in fact, it is in Chicago, and it is, I'm sure people of all backgrounds visit it. So, it, it will play a very good, it is playing, I'm sure. And one of my hopes when, when this thing is behind us is to spend some time at the Institute and to support you and your wife and all the others who are working with you.